On today's showcase, the Beatles turn 60 while the Dalai Lama sings and the UK and Russia take a big chance on social distancing. John, Paul, George and Ringo began their epic group in 1960. The Dalai Lama releases a new album. And museums in the UK and Russia reopen despite COVID-19. Much like a virus causing a global pandemic, there was once Beatlemania. Symptoms among teenagers included tears, screaming and the occasional fainting spell. The band, had it not been for Yoko, would have turned 60 years old. Here is Senna on what the remaining members are up to. Quincy Jones didn't have the greatest impression of the Beatles, calling them the worst musicians in the world. The four lads from Liverpool may not be the best musicians ever, but in many ways, they're the most successful band ever. The pop culture icons generated billions of dollars and their influence on music, fashion and film is incalculable. Though John, Paul and George were playing gigs since 1957, the Beatles formed in 1960 and Ringo Starr joined the group two years later. And as the former Beatle turns 80, he must be enjoying a sweet retirement. Except he's still rocking and rolling with a solo career, putting on a birthday charity show for Black Lives Matter. Last year, he also released Grow Old With Me, a song that's keeping the Beatles spirit up, featuring strings inserted from George Harrison's Here Comes the Sun and Paul McCartney's playing bass. The lyrics were written by John Lennon, which were quite touching for Star. So I thought what I'm going to do is, I love the song, you know, the emotion of him talking, you know, speaking for me, you know, he's been gone quite a while, but it's emotional to me, he was one of my greatest friends. Um, I said, I'm going to do it. So I did my part and uh, we got Joe Walsh on, on the finest guitar, she's a good pal. And I thought it would be great if Paul played on this. He's the only bass player I really want on this track because he's so melodic and, uh, you know, he's such a fine musician. And so I called him, he was coming into LA, and I said, well, I'd like you to play on this track. He said, okay, and that's what he did. I saw you flash a smile, that seemed to me to say you want But unlike McCartney, whose album Egypt Station in 2018 earned him number one album on Billboard 200 chart in over 36 years, Starr had a less than favorable relationship with streaming music. Streaming, I, I don't understand anymore because, you know, all I ever hear about is that you sell, you've streamed, your record has been streamed 17 million times and they give you a check for 12 bucks. <laughs> I don't understand that. That's, it, with the established musicians, that seems to be the problem. And the bigger problem with that is, there's nothing coming in for the new bands. Despite Starr's struggle with digital, the Beatles are still the best-selling band of all time. Last year, the band was streamed more than 1.7 billion times, a third of which came from 18 to 24-year-olds. So while the boys are now old men, their fans are as young as ever. Let's talk to Michael Starr, author of the book Ringo, with a little help. Hi, Michael. Thanks so much for joining us today. So, I mean, we oh, just heard you. that uh, they are still really popular with a lot of young fans around, actually. So, I mean, I know it's a very hard question, but it's the million dollar question here. What exactly is their appeal, you think? The, the Beatles were really, if you think about it, were really the first boy band in, in rock history. They, they were, they were uh, you know, very funny, all of them. They had a great sense of humor. Um, uh, 
uh, attractive, especially to, to young girls at that, at that time. They were terrific musicians. And the songs that they produced and, and wrote were just unbelievably catchy. I mean, you think, you know, I want to hold your hand. Uh, she loves you. Um, help. Uh, I feel fine. I mean, these were all, this is the kind of music that people really hadn't heard at that time. And the genius of, of, of the Beatles, all four Beatles, and particularly the songwriting of Lennon and McCartney, we see now how great those songs were. We're still talking about it 60 years later, um, almost 60 years later, uh, just how catchy and, and they were terrific musicians. They, all four of them melded together almost seamlessly, which is, uh, which is an extreme rarity in rock and roll. And it's that chemistry that really made them so special and continues to make them special as they're <clears throat> discovered by a younger generation of, of listeners. And would you say that they actually started a revolution in music because they were really connected with their fan base? They were. Uh, the Beatles were extremely connected with their fan base and were one of the first, if not the first, rock and roll group to have their own fan club. Uh, of course, we saw the effects of Beatlemania, which made them the most famous rock group on the planet um, at a time when <clears throat> people were listening to Bobby Darin and Frank Sinatra. Along came these four kids from Liverpool with this unbelievable energy and char uh, charisma and ability to play their instruments with, with this what they called the Liverpool beat, which had never really been heard before. Mm -hmm. They sort of adopted the, um, the American music styles of, of the blues and, 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 and girl groups from that era, and the Everly Brothers, and, and turned it into their own sound. And of course, they had um, help in the studio doing that from George Martin and, and the technicians at Abbey Road. But the sound they made was just something that nobody had ever heard before. And um, I'm and, sorry. Yeah. And they were also talking about controversial topics in pop culture. And that was really novel back then, wasn't it? It, it was. Particularly, they didn't start out that way. I mean, they, they started out singing love songs and, you know, I want to hold your hand. She loves you. I feel fine. But as the Vietnam War took over in, in around the world and especially in, in the U.S. and in England, um, John Lennon, who was the most outspoken of the four members, um, was outspoken about the war, and he was also asked about Christianity. And at one point, I think it was around 1966, mm -hmm. he told an interviewer that the Beatles were more popular than Christ. It was sort of taken out of context, but there was a big movement, especially here in the, in the U.S., to ban Beatles songs, and they were burning Beatles albums and big bonfires and it was a whole thing. He, he ended up um, apologizing for that, sort of. Mm -hmm. He basically just said his, his, his remarks were taken out of context. But also the, the drug culture that was taking over in the, in the mid-1960s, the Beatles were at the forefront of that also. And 60s fashion, um, they were wearing all the mod clothes, they were smoking pot, and a few of them were dropping acid. And so, yes, they were at the forefront of the whole 1960s cultural revolution mm -hmm. because their fans looked up to them to set the trends for all these different facets of, of society at that time. And they rarely ever disappointed in doing that. And we still keep talking about how relevant they are still to pretty much all generations, including uh, Gen Z. Do you think, how long do you think will this continue? I mean, is there a shelf life for Beatles relevancy? It's a good question. I, I don't think so. I mean, people thought there was a shelf life for Beatle relevancy in 1968 or, 19, or 1970 once they broke up. But it seems like their popularity has only continued to grow with each passing year, which is, which is remarkable. They're, they're sort of in that group with, let's say, Elvis Presley, where... I mean, there were two of the Beatles still alive. Two of them un have unfortunately passed away. But Elvis, you know, Elvis died in 1977, and he's as popular as he ever was. And I think the Beatles will continue to be popular. 
particularly with uh, Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney still touring, still making new music, and still with us to remind people of how special the band was. They're playing their old songs. Younger fans are discovering the Beatles on um, different platforms on the internet, YouTube. There are documentaries about them. Of course, their music it continues to stream worldwide. And it's it just has this sound that makes it um, sort of just like a touchstone for, for almost every country in the world. It seems to have a huge Beatles uh, fandom. And I think that's only going to continue to grow exponentially as we move forward. And let's talk about Ringo Starr. Uh, you have worked on Ringo Starr. You've written a book about him. I wonder what, why you think he is important for Beatles. Well, you know, it's it's funny because people, when, when people generally think about the Beatles, of course they think of John, Paul, George, and Ringo. But it's generally, it's always Ringo last. And, and I never quite understood that. He was such a big part of the original band. Um, but I think it was because He didn't write many songs and he didn't have the songwriting talent of John Lennon and Paul McCartney and, and George Harrison, uh, as he did later in the band's history. Uh, but Ringo was the backbeat of that band. You would not have the Beatles sound without Ringo Starr. And while he was the last member to join the original group, replacing Pete Best in, in 1962, uh, he was so uh, intrinsic to their sound and... John, Paul, and George hired him for a reason, because not only were they friendly with him personally, they knew him from Liverpool, they all grew up in the same area, but he was also known as the best drummer in Liverpool. Okay, so, John, uh, Michael, Paul, sorry to cut you off there, best drummer in Liverpool, for sure, but if you, do you think that if they kept the original drummer, would they still be popular, this popular, Beatles? I don't think so. I mean, that's one of those kind of arguments you can have in a bar. You know, what if Pete Best was still the drummer? But Pete Best never really fit in, even though he was from Liverpool. He never really quite fit in with John, Paul and George as far as their their personality and their sense of humor and their take on the world. Ringo did. And as soon as he joined, they, the, the four of them just clicked. And as I mentioned, he had known them previously and had even played with them at several clubs in, in Hamburg, Germany in the early 60s. So they knew what they were getting. They liked him a lot. He liked them. And once they started performing together, it was almost like, who is this guy Pete Best? <laughs> It's almost like Ringo was with the group forever. And it, it just wouldn't, his sense of humor, the way he um, came across when the Beatles first came to the, to the United States in 1964, he was the most popular band member. Yeah. It wasn't John Paul or George, it was Ringo. All right, Michael Starr, it was good to have you on our show today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Well, we've talked about their music. Next week, we'll look at Beatlemania at the movies. For now, let's move on to a different kind of album, one just produced by the Dalai Lama. Highness, we've been making the music for your album. Hmm? Can you please explain why you accepted our request to do this with you. I think I can say the very purpose of my life to serve as much as I can. Tibetan Buddhist leader the Dalai Lama marks his 85th birthday with an album. Inner World contains 11 tracks of mantras and chants mixed with new music. It's composed and recorded by two musicians from New Zealand, Junel and Abraham Kunin. I was really surprised he said yes. Uh, I was clear in my heart about this mission. <laughs> um, but I didn't, I thought I'd have to try and convince him. And that moment of recording him, my goodness, I was shaking like a leaf before I went in there. The album addresses the Dalai Lama's key concerns, courage, healing, wisdom, purification, protection, and humanity. He was profoundly present and expressive about the benefits of music and he was preaching to the choir obviously but he, he spoke at length very passionately about the power of music and his wish to be combined with it in order to, um, he, yeah, he said music can be, help people in a way that he can't and his 
whole purpose is to help people. So it was a perfect marriage for him, you know, with music. The call for healing and humanity comes at a time, though when challenges continue to mount. There is the coronavirus, race protests in America, violent attacks by extremist Buddhist monks in Myanmar, and India, where the Dalai Lama live in exile, and China, who vehemently opposes the Dalai Lama, have been engaged in deadly border clashes. But Kunin says the Dalai Lama remains unwayward. Happy birthday, Your Holiness. I think His Holiness really speaks to the oneness of humanity and that we are all brothers and sisters. He looks at the common denom denominator us as, a, as a one human race rather than um, a more divisive sort of approach. And uh, I think that's so poignant. The album release also comes following the ongoing political tension around the selection of the next Dalai Lama. The Chinese Foreign Ministry declared in 2011 that only its government can appoint the next Dalai Lama and whoever succeeds the 84-year-old exiled leader would not be given any recognition. So it's safe to say that the Dalai Lama's new album won't be topping the charts in Beijing anytime soon. Now, a quick look at some other stories from the world of arts and culture. Don't worry about yourselves, you'll be okay. Kevin Rafferty, the co-creator of the Atomic Cafe, has died of cancer at the age of 73. Rafferty's 1982 documentary critiques American involvement in nuclear warfare. His other directing credits include Blood in the Face, which looked at white supremacist groups, and Harvard Beats Yale 2929, which looked at the storied rivalry between the two American college football teams. A so-called stable sculpture by American artist Alexander Calder has sold for over five and a half million dollars in Paris. Auction house Art Curiel says the massive piece of art had been on display in a French park before the owner decided to sell it. How long have you been Ant-Man again? Not long. It just sort of happened. Marvel won't be cancelling the next Ant-Man sequel as feared. The movie's third installment will start production in June of next year. The coronavirus pandemic put the film's future in jeopardy. But apparently, work on the movie has only been postponed by several months. The National Gallery London is Britain's first major institution to reopen after the coronavirus lockdown. And while staffers are excited to come back, the new normal regulations are challenging everyone. One of London's trademarks, the National Gallery, has been closed for more than a hundred days, a record in the institution's nearly 200-year history. The gallery's director closely watched the reopening procedures of other museums in Italy, Spain and the United States. Following the advice of public health officials in England, new rules have been implemented. They will first of all have to make a, a, a booking to come and visit, which is new for the National Gallery, but that's one of the requirements of the new regime and the new setup. Uh, secondly, once you're in the building, uh, you'll be asked to wear a, a face covering uh, or a, a mask. Um, and thirdly, you'll find a, a socially distanced uh, gallery, so uh, we'll be keeping our distance from each other. Um, and that will, of course, reduce capacity, which in some ways is, is pleasant for the, the visitor because there'll be less people around. In other words, if you're one of those people who want to take their time enjoying the artwork without a lot of commotion inside, now is the time to visit. Not that it's been an easy feat for the museum to pull off. Organizers say planning the museum's return has been challenging. I think we at the National Gallery, because of our history and because of the National Gallery having stayed open during the war years and so on, um, we felt it incumbent on us to, to, to be ready for when it was possible to reopen. So uh, we worked in a very focused manner to do that. But the gallery was open and it was there for the London public as the bombs rained down. 
on the city. So we felt the responsibility uh, that, uh, as in the past, the National Gallery had been there for the public. Uh, we wanted to be there uh, when the opportunity arose to reopen. Even though it's free to visit the National Gallery, for the sake of managing the visitor numbers, people need to book time slots online. And because the opening hours have been reduced, they suggest you book ahead. Inside, foot-operated hand sanitizers, apps replacing audio guides, high-efficiency air filters and social distancing in the loo will be waiting visitors. It's perhaps not a huge price to take in a bit of art. We'd like to tell you the story of Ghanaian artist Zohra Opokru. She became stuck in Senegal when the coronavirus closed down the country's borders. But the global pandemic wouldn't be the biggest factor to affect her life. Zohra Opaku was in Senegal for an artist residence program when George Floyd was killed in the United States. Opaku responded with a project called Say Their Names. She puts together images of unidentified faces from ancient Egyptian art on her canvas. Opoku pays tribute to the lives lost because of racism. The recent happenings and protests following uh, George Floyd's death uh, have shaken us and awakened us, I believe, and um, sharpened our senses in what kind of world we, we want to live in. Um, for, for weeks I had no words. Um, I was... Sorry. And, but I needed something to express my anger. I mean, my emotions, because this is ongoing and repetitive and it's, it's not something what um, I can just um, observe. I really have to do something about it. Before moving to Ghana, she grew up in communist East Germany. She says she didn't see any black people around until the war came down when she was 13 years old. So, her works heavily deal with identity and a sense of home. She says, through my personal background, I'm constantly referencing how identity can be transformed according to the place of our origin or upbringing. It was already uh, very clear that I wanted to live in Africa, to also just experience who that is inside me, because I always felt like I try to be more, um, I don't know how to call it, be more white, you know, like just be more like the people in, in, around me. So, um, but being then um, in, in Ghana, it's like you, you can actually just express freely, like um, you are much more noisier, much more louder, you laugh more, you know, you dance more, definitely. And <laughs> you, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just uh, like the life is, is like very, very different. The artist was diagnosed with breast cancer last year and her works started to show a rising interest in death and the afterlife in the African culture. They also became more fragmented. She says her works are disconnecting the physical from the spiritual. Uh, after my diagnosis, I thought of my body uh, as kind of dismantled because of all the procedures I was going through and suddenly everything felt not anymore as part of myself and uh, I, I became really interested in stepping away from my photographic and screen printing norms by, um, by yeah, embracing just uh, new ways of how I can apply those techniques um, in collages. So while Opoku is stuck in Senegal, she says Africa has given her work a life with a different kind of soul. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Insta and Twitter account has more from the world of art and culture. I'm Ilf Berekitli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.